Alhamdulillahi Nahduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusna wa min sayyati amanina mah yahdihillahu falamudilahu wa min yudlil falahadiyalahu wa ashahadu ala illaha illallahu wa dahu la sharika lahu wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu Surely, unquestionably we praise, the praise belongs to Allah. The perfect praise belongs to him. We praise him. We seek his aid. We seek his forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and our own bad deeds. Whosoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whosoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I openly bear witness that there is no God, no deity, nothing worthy of worship except Allah, the one having no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu wasallam is his servant and messenger. Allah says and warns in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladina aminu taqullaha haqqa tukatihi wa la tamutuna ila wa antum muslimun. O oh, you who believe, regard your duty to Allah in truth as it should be regarded. And do not die except that you are Muslims. So we thank Allah for this day of Jummah. We thank Allah for giving us another day, another breath to show our gratitude to him. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Salat in congregation is 27 times better than praying alone. And each of our five prayers are multiplied by 10. So we are blessed exponentially when we make salat together. And our sins are forgiven in between our prayers. Can we ever be thankful enough, appreciative enough? Can we ever praise our Lord enough for all the blessings that he has bestowed upon us? We cannot, but it is a constant struggle, a constant striving to repay our debt, our deen, our debt to him. This deen and our prophet is a mercy and a blessing from Allah as a wajil. And we pray that others are guided to this mercy and to this blessing. Two weeks ago, we talked about Uthman radiallahu anhu and his generosity, his Sadaqa. This weekend, up until a couple days ago, I came back from California, from Los Angeles. I was in Hollywood, Beverly Hills, on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard, and we went past Rodeo Drive. We saw houses from the riches of rich, people on hills, houses 
far away from the poverty that is all around Los Angeles. The poorest of poor. And it gave me a sense of almost disdain for wealthy, rich people. So I thought about the chutbah today and what I wanted to discuss and I wanted to think about the relationship between rich and poor people in Al-Islam. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam says the poor Muslim will enter paradise before the rich by a half a day the length of which is 500 years. Now we know in the Quran it talks about the relativity of time and how a time can, one day can seem as a thousand years. So that half a day, because they enter paradise before the rich person, feels like 500 years. At a glance, it may mislead people to believe that being poor is better than being wealthy in Al-Islam. Some people may consider not pursuing wealth because they don't see the benefit in the hereafter. That mindset that I'd rather off be poor so I can be blessed. So is that a thing, that being poor is better than being rich? In our own background, in this country, and we may think of Christianity and the ideas that are in our mind of the stories of the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man was in the hell fire, and Lazarus, the poor man, the beggar, was in paradise. Or we may think of Jesus, the story that is told of Jesus, or reported of him in the Bible, which says that he says that a rich man, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Now, I don't know if you all know this or not. But the Quran is a correction and completion of previous scriptures. What the Quran says is something similar, but it has a great distinction. Allah says in the Quran, surely those who receive our revelation with denial and arrogance, the gates of heaven will not be open for them, nor will they enter paradise until a camel passes through the eye of a needle. That's the difference. In the story that is attributed to Jesus, it says just being rich makes it almost impossible for you to enter paradise. Allah says in the Quran, if you deny his signs and show arrogance, then you won't make it to paradise. See how it is a correction, previous scriptures. So Isa alayhi salam probably, most likely, did not say this. The words were mixed up in translation, in transmission. His story, his message was corrupted. If you want to know the true story, then you come to Allah and the Quran and Al-Islam. Allah says, or it is translated, and seek the ultimate abode with what Allah has given to you. And do not neglect your share of the dunya, of this world. So we are to seek the hereafter, but also to seek the pleasures of this world. And when we read this, we must realize that some Traditions of the Prophet wasallam, they have to be read in their full context. Because if we read them separately, we may have pause. For example, I said the rich person makes it into paradise before the poor person. Oh, oh stop, I did that wrong. The poor person enters paradise before the rich person. But both of them enter paradise, right? It just depends on what they do and how they do it to get there. In another translation, or in another, tra another tradition, it says the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says, I stood at the gates of paradise and saw the majority of the people who were entering were poor people. While the rich were forbidden to enter along with the poor until they had reckoned their accounts. Now these two hadith speak to the virtue of the poor and how many of them, the majority of them, have entered paradise before those who are rich. In a time, this happened, or the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came in a time when rich people were superior, similar to what we are having in Western society, and poor people are oppressed. Our Prophet is giving the poor the good news that despite their harsh conditions, if they are patient and persevere and they believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then they will enter paradise. However, it doesn't mean that being poor is better than being rich. 
these two hadith serve as a warning to wealthy people to utilize your wealth correctly. The evidence are found, in, are found in other traditions which talk about the virtue of the rich. Our prophet is recorded as saying, the upper hand is better than the lower hand. Right? The one who is giving is better than, or uh, let me say this, the giving is better than the receiving. Not the one giving. But giving, giving of what you have is better than receiving. So the upper hand, the one that is giving is better than the one that is receiving. In another tradition, the poor people came to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they said, "O oh, Messenger, the possessors of great wealth have high ranking in paradise and everlasting bliss." They said, "We believe in Allah, and they believe in Allah. We pray, and they pray. We fast, and they fast. We give zakat, and they give zakat. However, they free slaves." They free those people who are in bondage. We don't have enough money to do that. So our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to them, this is what you do, do then. After prayer, you say SubhanAllah 33 times. You say, Alhamdul you say Alhamdulillah 33 times. You say Allahu Akbar 33 times. To increase your blessing. So you know what happened after that. The rich people heard it and started doing that too. <laughs> <laughs> they, went, they went back to the prophet and said, listen, now they're doing that too. How can we equal them? So Allah says in the Quran to compete with righteousness. Right? They're trying to be more righteous than their fellow man, than their fellow Muslim, their fellow Muslim. And our prophet says, this is Allah's grace which he bestows on whom he wills. He gives, you know, the saying, with great power comes great responsibility. He gives them, because money is a sense of power. He gives them power and responsibility. But there is a way to equal that out. If you think about it, our prophet gave us the way to equal that out. Vicar. So do more than 33. Remember Allah more often than your fellow man. If you can't give to the poor, you can't feed the poor, if you are poor yourself. This clearly shows that our prophet commends the wealthy for their charity in helping others. As a matter of fact, our mother, Khadijah, was wealthy. Abu, Abu, Bar, I mean, Abu Bakr was wealthy. Umar was wealthy. And so was Uthman, radiallahu anhum. All of them had wealth. In fact, there was a businessman who was one of the Sahaba who was promised paradise. He was promised paradise because of the, the wealth that he had and he amassed, he gave to those who were in need. Allah and the Prophet is commending the poor and rewarding them with paradise for their hard work, perseverance, and patience. However, he also says, do not succumb to disbelief. The Prophet says, poverty almost leads to disbelief. The same thing is true of wealth. And money. We know when people have amassed a large amount of wealth, they think they are not in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not in need at all. Right? So the more wealth they amass, the more likely they are to neglect or reject or forget to praise and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a warning for both of them. Our Prophet and Allah also commends. The rich for giving charity, for relieving others of their debt, giving in times of turmoil, and places them in a high ranking for those who give of their wealth. But if they are wealthy irresponsibly, they are held to judge as well. As I said, with great power comes great responsibility. The more money you have, the more wealth you amass, this is nothing but sustenance that Allah gives you or Something that Allah gives you so you can give to other people who are in need. This is why I had such a problem with Beverly Hills. And they have their own police department. They have their own ambulance. They have their own fire department. They have their own everything. And far removed from those people who are living destitute. They won't allow them on Rodeo Drive at all. Everywhere else I went, there are people... There was a man who was using drugs right on the side of the street, and right beside him was someone else who apparently used the drugs as well. He was 
in a stupor. People living in tents all over the place. And two blocks from that are people living on hills. More money than they can do anything with. So we strive and work hard to amass wealth, to amass riches, to benefit ourselves, to benefit our families, and to benefit other people. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the most beloved people to Allah are those who are beneficial to other people. That's what our job is, service to other people. When Allah says that we are to worship Allah, and that's why we were created, worshiping Allah is serving humanity, serving his creation. Because he doesn't need our worship. What can he do with it? He doesn't need our prayers. He doesn't need our zakat. All the zakat is for people. He says the, the most beloved deed to Allah is to make a Muslim happy or to remove one of their troubles or forgive one of their debts or feeding the hungry. These are the best actions to give. And as I said about Uthman, there was a poor man who was envious of him. He said, whatever you give, you are giving more than I am. Because if you have $100 and I have $1,000, if you give $10, it means more to you than my $10. A long time ago, there were two men. One was a poor man who was a believer, who was thankful, who was pleased with his life and happy what Allah had provided for him. And there was another man who was a rich man. Allah had bestowed great bounties on him, gave him beautiful gardens, a beautiful home, trees growing, and he had rivers flowing. Tremendous wealth. He even had a castle. Now this rich man was arrogant and greedy with his wealth. He didn't give to anybody. He didn't praise Allah. He wasn't thankful for his blessings. In fact, he thought it was him that amassed his wealth. It was my own ingenuity, my own intelligence that amassed his wealth. Allah didn't give me this. He had enjoyed his bounty so much he would go outside and look at his garden, look at his fruits, look at his castle, look at the rivers flowing underneath and thank himself for it. And then the poor man, the believer, came to him one day and said, Oh, rich man, Allah granted you this great bounty, but Allah will ask you on the day of judgment, what did you do with all this stuff that I gave you? Don't be fooled by your wealth. One day you will be held to account. And the rich man got upset. He grew even more arrogant. And he said, basically, shut up, old man. Oh, shut up, poor man. How can you give me advice? I got money. You don't. I have riches. I have wealth. He said, I have children. I have slaves and servants, and you don't. How can you tell me? Unfortunately, too many of us today are the same way. We look up to people who have money and wealth and think that they can give us advice because we think they did something. They're something. They're more intelligent than us. They are more ingen ingenuitive. They're more something than us. Right? But what it is, is Allah bestowing bounty on them. It's a test for them. Their wealth is a test. And this man thought that he had done all of this, these things himself. Right? We were talking about a basketball player. LeBron James didn't make himself six foot six. Make himself run really fast and be able to jump and throw a ball. Allah did. So whatever he can do is from Allah. Not from himself. So the rich man grew more arrogant. He told him to be quiet. The rich man laughed and said, I don't believe there will be a day when I will be judged. I have all these wealth and I have amassed all of this power. And even if there is a day of judgment, this Lord that gave me this, he's going to show favor on me in paradise. He has to. He showed favor on me here. So if he gave me money here, then he must love me and show me favor in the hereafter. And the poor man said to him, do not disbelieve, O rich man. It is Allah who created you from dirt and provided you with all your wealth and provided you with all your children and provided you with all your servants. And I have less than you, less wealth, less children, but Allah can grant me a greater reward in paradise, greater than your wealth, greater than your children. So do not disbelieve. The rich man again grew even more arrogant and insisted on disbelief and the believer left him. And he says, remember that Allah gave you these blessings. The believer also continued to pray for him, saying, hopefully one day this man will seek guidance from his Lord. The next morning, the rich man wakes up 
His castle is gone. His gardens are gone. And everything is gone. Allah took everything away. His, his garden was desolate and empty. The trees were dry. The leaves and the fruits had fallen down and the river had dried up. Allah had sent on them a great on him a great flood and strong winds which destroyed his two gardens, destroyed everything that he had. He started crying and weeping. His wealth totally and completely defined him. You know, you talk about the people who are rich in Beverly Hills and when they lose their money, they lose anything. They're likely to, they should be on suicide watch because that's all that they have. Their fame and wealth defines them. He fell to the ground crying, weeping, saying, I wish I had not associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and I didn't disbelieve and I listened to that poor man. I listened to be thankful because everything that I have now is lost. This is a story from Surah Kaf, the cave, which we are supposed to read every Juma anyway. It is a lesson of humility and why we should have humility, why should we should give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why we should avoid ignorance and arrogance, and why we should use our wealth for good. And Allah continues. He says, the example of this light is like rain, which we send down from the sky and the vegetation on earth mingles with it, and then it becomes one day dry remnants scattered by the wind. Our Imam Fareed used to say everything in the Quran is for human beings. If we put that into context, we think of, if we think of rain and the vegetation as two human beings, a man and a woman coming together and having children, even your children and everyone you have and everyone you see, all of us here, one day will wither away and be gone. So we have to give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything that we have. Everything that we have, including our life, is given to us. It is a loan that we have to give back. Wealth and children are ornaments of this life, but the everlasting life, the good deeds that you have, always last. Allah continues, beware of the day when we will blow the mountains away and the earth will be laid bare and all of humanity will be left alone. They will be presented to their Lord in rows. This, this brings such imagery to me that everything will be laid to bear. And they will say to those people who denied the return, you surely have returned to us as we created you in the first, although you claim that you will never meet this appointed time. Allah says, if I created you once, why don't you think I can't create you again? If I gave you a conscience and I gave you this world to navigate in, what makes you think that you won't come back to me and explain what you did in this world and what you did with what I gave you? Allah says in the Quran, the record of the deeds will be laid out open and you will see the wicked in fear for what is written in those records. They will cry, woe to us. What kind of record is it that does not leave any sin, small or large, unlisted? They will find whatever they did present before them. And your Lord will not wrong anyone in any way. This is a terrifying thing for those people. It should be terrifying for us. Especially terrifying for those who do not turn to their Lord in thanks. We pray that we remain on the Surah to Mustaqim. That when those records are open, there has blocks on those, like the FBI files from the bad things that we did that Allah has erased with the good things that we have done and because we have asked for his forgiveness and we have turned to him. Let us stop now and ask Allah for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ayya sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi 
sabihi wa man wala ajma'in. The praise, the perfect praise belongs to Allah. Lord of all systems of knowledge, Lord of the worlds, Lord of all that exists, is how it can be translated. May Allah's blessings and peace be bestowed upon our noble leader Muhammad sallallahu wasallam, upon his family, upon the companions, and upon his followers. All of us, all together, all over the world. We know of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Bill Gates. But do you all know the lesson of Karun? You know Jeff Bezos' wife. So he's the wealthiest man, I think, right now. Because, you know, it's, it changes from day to day or week to week. His wife or his ex-wife gave more in charity than he did. She was uh, given a certain amount of his wealth. And she gave charity to all the uh, HBCUs around here. She has given more in wealth than he did, even though he is the wealthiest man in the world. He has $200 billion, something, something crazy like that. But whatever amount she gave, she gave more in percentage than he did. But at any rate, the man Karun was from the children of Israel. He was said to be Musa alayhi salam's cousin. Allah said that he was a trans transgressor and a tyrant amongst the people of Bena Israel. So he was of the children of Israel and he was also tyrannical towards them. Right? Musa alayhi salam not only had to contend with the Pharaoh and, and uh, Uman, Haman, the uh, Egyptian priest, but also with traitors in his midst, traitors in his own group. The Pharaoh was in charge of the children of Israel. Obviously, the children of Israel are enslaved. They are living in ghetto populations, right, similar to what is going on today. And they are being controlled and beaten and abused for labor, and they are being treated terribly, being tortured. And when you treat people horribly for a long period of time, there's obviously going to be rebellion. So for the Pharaoh, he figured out a way to avoid this rebellion is by having some people of the children of Israel to control those other people, what we might call a traitor, what we call a sellout, right? And this is what Karun was. He had certain people that he paid large amounts of money for telling on the children of Israel if they were plotting to rebel or whatever they were doing, tell anything that they were doing. And he would report this back, and, he would, and this man, Karun, amassed a large amount of money for doing this. So he must have been a really good, what do they call that, um, CI, uh, confidential informant. But for the opposition or for the oppressor, he, sold, he told so much, he was so good at his job of snitching and telling, right, that he amassed a large amount of wealth. And his wealth was so large that he had huge votes and the keys for those votes, they said they were leather keys. The keys were so heavy that strong men, groups of strong men would have to carry the key to the vote in order to open the vote. And they would get exhausted just carrying the keys. So that just imagine how large these, vote, these votes are. Because it was more than one vote, apparently. Multiple votes and different keys. Huge, huge keys to this vote. And... In there, they had obviously had extreme security around to lock these gates. But if, so if you can imagine how big these keys are, you imagine how large the votes are, or the votes are. And when the security guards would come and help open this vault, he would just look in it and smile. Right? He is so happy with all the gold and silver that he has amassed in being a traitor to his own people. And everyone, even the slaves, are looking in and seeing this. They see this man who's living like a millionaire, like a billionaire of his time, while they are living in poverty. He's driving the nice camel, the nice horses, right, while they're walking. He, has, he lives in a nice home while they live in a shanty homes. And he has this vault full of everything. And then the people say to him, listen, don't be happy about acquiring your wealth unlawfully. Don't be happy about being a tyrant. Don't be happy about being the oppressor or helping the oppressor. You are harming us in order to gain your own wealth. Don't be happy about extorting us. Don't be happy about doing wrong. Allah doesn't love those who are happy for their wrongdoing. And he has prepared for you a hereafter 
for all that you do, to hold account for all that you do. So don't be focused on this world, focus on the hereafter. Focus on what Allah has prepared for you. And what does Karun say in response? Something similar to the other rich man. I, I acquired all this wealth myself. I got all this money for my own experience, for my own knowledge, for my own blood, sweat, and tears, despite the fact that he got it from telling so other people can be harmed. I'm the one who worked hard for this wealth. I'm the one who put the effort in for all of this money. So I don't care what you all are talking about. Right? I got money now. Allah says in response, or it is translated, didn't he know before that Allah had destroyed before him many nations who was richer than him, who was stronger than him, who was more stable than him? So Karun gathered his workers, his slaves, and started parading his money all around the children of Israel, marching in the middle of them with money, showing his wealth. He had, um, he had horses that had gold, uh, coverings over them. He was walking. He had gold all over top, all over him, like some of our entertainers now, right? Flaunting his gold while we are impoverished. Some of the children of Israel saw this, and they were attracted by his wealth. They wanted to be like him. They wished that they was wealthy like Karun was. They wanted his great fortune. They said he was a lucky person, lucky to have all of this. But Allah also talks about the believers. Those who had faith, those who were pious, those who were righteous and had knowledge of the Torah. Now also, I forgot to mention that Karun was one who was eloquent in his articulation of the Torah. So he, was a, he had a singing voice. So not only was he rich, he was a singer, right? So he's singing, so he's already, people are already already adoring him, liking him because of his wealth, liking him because of his voice. And just like us today, many of us people today or people who worship people on television, we think since Allah gave him this money, gave him this talent, maybe he's somebody. Maybe he should be on this level and, and I should be adoring him or admiring him. But there are people who are pious who are actually following the Torah, not just reciting it beautifully, who said that he should be more reluctant to be so boastful and bragging. It says the reward of Allah is by far better than what Karun has. Then Allah begins to show his power. So in the tradition it says that Karun goes to Musa. He's he is jealous of Musa and his following. The first thing he tries to do is to smear his name. He hires a prostitute to say that he has been with that lady, accusing Musa alayhi salam of adultery. And in the same way, when Musa was, when Musa accidentally killed a man, he fell down in prostration. The same thing happened here. As soon as the lady said this allegation, he fell down, made two rakas to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He got back up and Musa was a big, strong man. He said to the, to the lady, who told you to do this? Apparently, he said in a stern enough voice, but she told the truth immediately. She said it was Karun, right? So he, so Allah, I mean, so Musa alayhi salam says to, says to Allah, please punish this man. He's tarnished my name. And you know how Allah does about people's names, especially when it comes to chastity. We have, we have ayahs in the Quran of Allah defending Isha, I mean, Aisha radiallahu anha and Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well, for people saying that she was unchaste, right? So the same thing is true of his prophets. They're saying that he did something that was unchaste. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will punish him for this. So a little bit after that, Calhoun is feeling himself, right? He says, look, I'm rich. I got all this money. I know you're a prophet and all that. Yeah, yeah, you're a prophet. You talk to God and all of that. But listen, I got all of this money. I can show you, because he thought, a rich person and a prophet are on the same level. He said, I can make invocations. I'll ask Allah for something. You ask Allah for something. Let's see who gets it. Right? So I don't know what he did. He didn't say what he asked for. He asked for rain or something that didn't come. He asked for more wealth that didn't come. Everything he asked for, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give it to him. When Musa asked for whatever he asked for, he received it. Because obviously Musa is telling the truth. In the same way with the magician. You know, Musa is actually being sincere while this other person is lying. 
So, since what he tried to invocate didn't come true, Musa said, please, Allah, punish this man now for all of the wrongdoing he has done. And he starts to sink into the desert, to, into the desert sand. His feet start to sink. And Musa alayhi salam says, take him. Then he starts to sink a little bit further. His knees go down. Take him, Allah. Then his shoulders go down. Then it says, the, his, he sunk as well as his house. Now in the Bible, it talks about a man named Kara, who is basically the same person. They have different, they are given different names or different titles. And the same thing happened. The earth swallowed him whole. And in fact, some of those people that were admiring him, it says 249 of the children of Israel followed him in this invocation against Musa alayhi salam. So it says all of them were swallowed whole, 250 with him included. So when it says the house in the Quran, it could mean his house, his wealth, but as well as those people who followed behind him as well. But all of those people were swallowed by the earth for his arrogance, for his disbelief, for his questioning the Prophet, Muhammad, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, as well as trying to smear his name. Now in this, in the idea of Black History Month, I did want to add something from some other person who was a Muslim, pious Muslim, who was also wealthy. Because I want to give you the juxtaposition of these things. What you should do with your wealth and what you should not do with it. Musa, Mansa Musa, I want to make sure these are, are, are explained correctly. Musa, alayhi salam, was a prophet for the children of Israel. Mansa Musa was an African king in Mali in about the year, I think it was, uh, yeah, 13, around 1300, 1324, right? And he was considered to be the wealthiest man to ever live. And we talked about Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and all of them. They said Mansa Musa's wealth estimated at about $400 billion, right? And he amassed this through his kingdom. So he inherited this, right? And his kingdom in Mali spread from Mali to Senegal, to Gambia, to, um, to Niger, to uh, Nigeria, Chad, all over the place. He had a huge, huge kingdom. His kingdom developed Timbuktu and Gao into important structural and cultural centers. He had architects coming from Arabia, coming from other parts of Africa to design and build in his city. And Mansa Musa turned his kingdom into a sophisticated kingdom of learning in the Islamic world. I don't know if we know enough about this man, Mansa Musa. Brother here told me that we should know, know more about him. We should speak more about him. He spent most of his time growing the religion of Al-Islam in his kingdom. He was a devout Muslim. We know about his pilgrimage to, to Mecca during his, for his Hajj. But do you know how long it lasted? It took a year because he traveled from Mali to Mecca, right? It took from 1324 to 1325, a span of 2,700 miles on camel. This man is traveling for his Hajj, right? It is called the most illustrious moment in Western African history. Our writers wrote about this man who had an envoy of 10,000 people, dozens of camels carrying hundreds, 300 pounds of gold, each of them having 13 tons of gold, or it, it amassed to 18 tons of gold for his Hajj, equaling what is today is $957 million. And he gave all of his entourage, all of these tens of thousands of people, he fed all of them, he clothed all of them, all the way, and the animals, all the way from Mali to Mecca. He gave gold away to the poor on route, on the 2,700 mile route, he was giving away gold. And he passed through Mecca, he passed on his way to Mecca through Cairo, and then he passed through Medina, and he was also using gold to trade for souvenirs. It is reported that he built masjids every Friday, every Juma. Even in Cairo, Mansa Musa met with the Sultan, and his caravan spent and gave away so much gold that it decreased the value of gold in Egypt for 12 years. That's how much gold he gave away. 
Timbuktu, which he built, became a center of trade, culture, and Islam. Merchants came from all over to, to be in this place where merchandise is being sold, where Al-Islam is being taught. Universities were founded in this city and marketplaces. Timbuktu became a center where Islamic scholars would come to teach. The universities developed jurists, they developed astronomers and mathematicians, joined Muslim scholars from Africa and Arabia. News traveled from the Mediterranean all the way to southern Europe. In Italy and Spain, they came there to give merchandise to learn, to study in this man's kingdom. Even, and, and today still Timbuktu stands, his reign had universities that collected books in, uh, collected books that were larger than books in uh, the Library of Alexandria. The university had a capacity to house 25,000 students, one of the largest in the world, and it had roughly one million manuscripts. Now, so you've seen those manuscripts, a picture of those, they're in Arabic. So if we learn Arabic and go to South and go to Western Africa, we can read and see those scriptures, those manuscripts that are, that are written of our history, of a history of a great empire of Al-Islam that is largely unnoticed, largely unknown. And I wanted to end with one last story about a Sahaba. Allah says in the Quran, the likeness of those who spend the wealth, their wealth in the way of Allah is the likeness of a grain of corn. It grows seven ears, and each of those ears has a hundred grains. And Allah multipl multiplies multiply, Allah gives multiple increase to whom he pleases. So in the year 640, rain stopped coming, there was a drought, people didn't have food, the fig trees stopped, show, stopped uh, giving figs, the olives, there were no more olives from the olive branches, the people of Medina, the people, the animals were starving without food. And people were so hungry that they started eating leaves just in order to survive. Without food, people started to starve. But there was a wealthy man among them, Uthman, radiallahu anhu. And you can imagine the hope that people had when they found out that he was bringing a caravan of 1,000 camels, all of them carrying food for all the people there. They started imagining the smell of the food cooking in their houses. They started, their mouths started watering, thinking about the food that they would taste because they hadn't tasted food in weeks. Thinking about going to bed with a full belly. Knowing the caravan belonged to Uthman, they also knew that he was a generous person. So they knew that he was going to give them a good price for that food. But similar to the, the well story that we talked about, the merchants heard about it as well. They heard about him sending this caravan of a thousand camels, bringing food, and they figured, we got to get these, we gotta get these uh, camels and get this food. What we'll do is go to Uthman, Uthman and give him a good price for it. And then we can hack the price up to whatever we want. Right? Everybody's starving. If you're starving, I can charge you $1,000 for a hamburger, right? Instead of $5. So they went to him. And they knew that he drove a hard bargain. So they knew whatever they asked him initially, he's going to say no to. Right? And that's what happened. He says, they went to him and said, listen, we'll, we'll buy it from you for double the price. And he says, I am afraid I cannot do business with you for I have already received a better offer. The merchants were diligent. They were persistent. They said, listen, we got to get this. You know, everybody has, nobody has food. He's the only one with food. We got to figure out a way to get this. So they huddled together and said, listen, we'll go with a, a better offer. So they said, we'll double it. We'll triple it. He again says, I am afraid I cannot do business with you, for I have already received a better offer. They gathered together finally and said, listen, I don't know who he got this offer from, but he's, going, he's not even going to get a profit if he, keep, if he doesn't get this money that we are giving him. So let's go back and say we'll give him five times the amount of the value for this food. So they go back to Uthman and say, listen, we'll give you five times the value for this food. He said, he said again, I am sorry, I cannot do business with you. 
You see, I have received a better offer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For Allah has said that anyone who gives away his wealth in Allah's name will get back far more than he gave away. So Uthman anhu, refused all of the money of the merchant's offering. Instead, he gave the food away for free. He gave it away all in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and every person prayed for him. This person is another man who already is guaranteed price five times over. And just to reflect, just to remember, Allah says it's like a grain. Each grain each is like a grain and each grain has seven ears and each ear has a hundred grains. And Allah multiplies that. So him giving away these thousand camels with all that food is multiplied exponentially. And every time they pray for him and all the food that they have, the sustenance they have within themselves, he receives blessings for that over and over and over again. Perhaps the people of wealth today can learn from our deen of al-Islam and we can learn to whatever wealth we have, whatever small amount we have, we can give. Because Allah says you never decrease when you give charity, when you give sadaqa. Never. And if Allah's word is true and it is, then we should be taking heed. Peace be upon Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna muhammadan rasulallah, Hayya la salah, hayya la la falal, Qabaqa matita la, Qabaqa matita la, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan rasulallah. <coughs> Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbi Alameen. Rahman Rahim. Malik Yawmadeen. Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een. Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeen. Sirat al-Ladina and Amta alayhim. Ghayr al-Ma'dubi alayhim. Walad Dhaleen. Amin. Li ila fi Quraysh, ila fihi rahlati shita'i wa sayf. فَلْيَحْبُدُ رَبَاهَةَ الْبَيْتِ أَلَّذِي أَتْعَهْمَهُ مِنْ جُوْئِ وَأَمَنَاهُ مِنْ قَوْفِ Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Sami Allahu Lam Alhamdulillah Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Malik Yawmadeen Iyaka na'abudu wa Iyaka nasta'een Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeen Sirat al-ladina an'amta alayhim Ghayri al-ma'adubi alayhim Walad-dhaleen Amin Ara'ita al-ladhi yukathibu bideen فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُوءُ الْيَتِيمَ لَا يَقُودُ عَلَى تَعْمَ الْمِسْكِينَ فَوِيلُ لِلْمُسَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ إِنْ صَلَاتِهُمْ سَأُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ سَمِي اللَّهُ لَمِنْ الْحَمِيدِ اللَّهُ Allah, Allah, Allah.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Assalamualaikum Assalamu alaikum. Um, I wanted to give peace and salams to Imam as uh from Newport News. We appreciate you here, brother. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Imam. Uh, make sure everybody gives him salams for coming and attending uh, Juma with us. Um, first and foremost, don't forget your zakat obligations. Zakat boxes are right here on the on the sides, uh, as well as the the dark brown boxes outside. If you okay. want to give zakat via cash app, you can do it at <coughs> dollar sign M W S A L A A M. That is dollar sign M W Salam. If you wanted to mail it in, you can mail it in directly to the Masjid at 614 West 35th Street, 23508. Or you can mail it to our P.O. Box, which is P.O. Box 1802, North of Virginia, 23501. I think there are still some uh, small bean pies that are left in the uh, left in the back. They are four dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Brother Hanif is, is not here today. He told me to hold on to some, but he I guess he got his fill. Um, there will be Fajr in the morning, inshallah. I'll be here in the morning uh, to open for Fajr prayer. Um, there will be Talim on Sunday at one o'clock, inshallah. Um, and also let us remember that uh, Brother Ashanti has uh, Arabic class on the first and third Sunday at 11 o'clock. So it won't be this Sunday. It'll be the following Sunday. And it is uh, free. Uh, so if you can come out, please attend. I'm, I'm still in this uh, in the class for um, our leadership in our community. And we are talking about Arabic and how it is important. The first thing we were talking about was Ikra. The angel Jabril said Ikra to our prophet, and uh, he realized it meant to recite. The Quran is, Al Quran means the recitation. So if you are not able to recite, then you are leaving out some part of your deen. So just reading it is not the same as the recitation. Um, so that, that is quite important. I want to make sure that it is uh, articulated. If you want to be a member of Masjid William Salam, uh, the form is outside on the board. Uh, if you want to, in your zakat, uh, pay towards the building fund. Make sure you write that on the zakat form under other. So you want to give to the building fund because as I said, we are doing renovation here. We're going to change the carpet, do painting, and still fix that outside wall. So if you want to give strictly for that, uh, you can do so. Um, also, uh, Brother Latif is uh, feeling down. He is uh, under the weather uh, at the moment. Uh, as well as other people who are still under weather, um, Brother Alushula, I haven't heard about his uh, progression or, um, or his, what is going on with him now, uh, as well as um, Sister Karen and anyone else that you know, because it's other people that I'm not aware of. In fact, I don't know if I mentioned to you all that the uh, brother who used to deliver the uh, chips is doing much better. He's uh, in rehab right now, uh, physical, physical rehabilitation, so he's doing much better. So please continue with your du'as uh, for everyone. There's still COVID going on. As you see, everybody in here has masks. I'm going to put my mask back on in a moment. Um, and I also wanted to say that I thank you all. I appreciate you all, everyone who was on 
uh, on social media, everyone who was in attendance, everyone who was a member. I went to a couple of different uh, massages in uh, Los Angeles and Los Angeles period. I would much rather live here. Uh, I couldn't wait to get back here. I went there to watch a basketball game. My team lost, um, but just I, I like the, the people here. I like the environment here. I like Norfolk, Virginia. I loved it more so than any of what they show on television. is kind of like what they do on Facebook. You know, you saw the best pictures, but when you go there, it is not the best. <laughs> all right. Uh, I don't want to get into a tangent, but yes, I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. So much. Thank <laughs> you.